أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورضي الله تعالى عن سادة التابعين وعلماء العاملين وأئمة الأربعة المجتهدين ومقالديهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, we begin with the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. We praise Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and send a complete peace and blessings upon our master Muhammad and his family and his companions. May Allah be pleased with the elite from among the tabi'een, the right acting scholars, the four mujtahid imams, and all of those who follow them until the day of judgment. I mean, Alhamdulillah, we missed a few days, a couple of days of class because we are renovating the sister's area, which is upstairs in the masjid. You know, I mentioned on here many times that, you know, I do electrical work. So that's the part that I'm playing in this whole renovation thing. I'm doing the electrical. And so for the last couple of classes, I wanted to finish in these two rooms that I was working in so that our brother can go ahead and close everything up, put the ceiling up in the walls and stuff like that. You know, when you're doing uh, construction or renovation, the people who put up the walls can't really do anything until the electricians and the plumbers and everything do what they need to do. So alhamdulillah, I didn't want to delay that longer, any longer than I had to. And so, it ran kind of late, so this is why I wasn't able 
to do the classes on Monday and Tuesday. Alhamdulillah. And you know when you're dealing with old buildings and you start opening up walls and stuff, you start finding uh, stuff. You start finding all the substandard, I was trying to find a, a, a decent word. I found it, substandard work that was done that you can't readily see. You know, when you start opening up stuff, you be like, wow, why they do it like this? Or why didn't, why didn't they fix this the last time that they were working on it? Why they leave it like this? That type of stuff. So, alhamdulillah, we intended to open the sister's prayer area this Juma, but they're going to be praying with us again. The sisters are going to be praying with us again this week because we have more work to do. In other words, we started only intending to do a certain section, but we might as well go ahead and finish all of it, knock it all out while stuff is open, right? So this is what we're going to do. So it's going to be closed up there for at least another week. But when the sisters come for Juma or for any of the prayers, they can still use their wudu station and their bathroom up there. And if anyone would like to help financially with the renovation cost, please feel free to do so. Samira, can you post the links where our family can help out? We have some brothers who come in to do some demolition and other stuff when they get off work. You have one brother who he's still doing his other job, but he's doing the main contracting work. You have myself doing the electrical work. But we still need to pay for materials. And some of the people who are working do need some money. Like those brothers who don't have a nine to five and they can dedicate their time to getting our sister's area up and running sooner, we want to be able to compensate them. We want to be able to pay them. We're not trying to be like those other massages who before it became socially unacceptable that they used to have the sisters area substandard. Sisters be praying in a glorified closet or something like that. We're not trying to do all that. So I'm waiting for Samira to post a link so that you all can see how you can help. There you go, Samira. That a girl. So alhamdulillah, we're doing that. Uh, also, I want to inform you. You know that a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I, I don't know, weeks, weeks, months, they're all the same to me. But anyway, uh, Oh, I'm looking at the dates right here. You know, on August 12th, we uh, sent some money to the Central Masjid in Albreda, which is in the area where Kuta Kente is from in the Gambia. If you remember, 
we sent them twenty-two thousand dollars. That's their the name of their currency, and that was the equivalent of four hundred and fifty-nine dollars and ninety-eight cents. And we shared the video of them receiving the money and expressing their appreciation. Some of you, after I reported that they received the money, some of you sent some money again. And so I sent that on August 21st. And this time we sent $545, which is more than the first time in 26 cents, which came to 26,000 of their dollars. And so, alhamdulillah, they received it, and they also sent video and audio expressing their appreciation and thanks for uh, supporting them and building their masjid so that they can finally get out of the old dilapidated masjid that has serious structural problems. So, alhamdulillah, they thank, and I thank all of you for supporting and helping the Muslims Alhamdulillah. And so uh, just in the same way that you all helped with the masjid in Gambia, I hope you all don't forget about the masjid right here in the United States, <laughs> in Pittsburgh here. Alhamdulillah. We don't want to leave our sisters out there. We're going to do it anyway. But, you know, Alhamdulillah, we're not sitting on a big bag of money. So anything we spend, you know, uh, is coming out of our reserve. So if you uh, feel moved in your heart to help us uh, get our sister's area squared away, then we will definitely appreciate it. Alhamdulillah. So, Alhamdulillah, who do we have here? Brother Talib, Isa Abdu'l-Vah here, my beloved brother. Fatima Muhammad. It's always good to see you, Alhamdulillah. Coming straight from the Caribbean. Is it Caribbean or Caribbean? I never got that straight. Imam Abdul Rauf. Wa alaikum salam rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hakeem, Muhammad, Bilal, and everyone else who uh, is present. I return the greetings to you all. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we left off on page 160. Am I correct, Samira? La. 150. What page? 150. Hmm. Why did I have my bookmark on 160? Maybe that's why I, where we I intended to stop next. You're right. You right. My bookmark was on the old. Oh, I was right, and you were wrong. <laughs> you was right. 160 is correct. Say that again. I was right. Yes, you were correct. And you were wrong. And I was wrong. Let's remix that. You was wrong. And I, I was, was right. wrong and you was right. <laughs> Abdullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Abdul Rahim. Okay. So uh, let's begin with our fight here. May Allah reward and bless all of those, including the author of this text, Muhammad Abdullah al Ahari, for. Uh, taking the trouble and the effort not only to study study but preserve these sacred writings from our ancestors wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh imam ibn frisco alhamdulillah bismillah a'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar rajeem a'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar rajeem a'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar rajeem bismillah ar rahman ar rahim Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sabbihi wa salama tasliman. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salamu ala ibadihi al-ladhina stafa amma ba'ad. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, 
I seek refuge in Allah from the rejected shaitan. May Allah bless our master, Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, companions, and give them peace. All praise is due to Allah, for he is sufficient for us. Peace be upon his slaves whom he has chosen. As to what follows, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi to everyone. And wa alaikum assalamu alaikum to everyone that has given the greetings. We're on page 160. Omar Ibn Said's inscription in the notebook of John P. Owen of Wilmington, North Carolina. Did you want me to read the footnote? Sure, go ahead. The text begins at the rear cover. The translation is by line number. This translation is by David Gabriel Bobby, Bob, Bob, Bobayan, sent from Babayan at alumni dot harvard dot edu during january 2019 he makes the following comment about his translation in this translation i use some wordings from sayyid hussein hussein nasser's the study quran as well as my own judgment this effort will be improved by later translation translators but here is a place to start one for the first the unique with no beginning, and the last, the everlasting with no end, verily Korah was of the people of Musa. Oh, woe to every this point. Is, this is, as a footnote indicates, from Surah Al-Qasas, which is chapter number eight, 28 of the Quran, of an extremely, 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 I lost count of how many times I said extremely, but extremely important surah if you want to understand the modern times. If you want to understand the time and the movements and the way society is structured, you have to have a deep understanding of surah qasas. Surah 28, you have to. If you don't understand the modern world in which we live in, in light of Surah Al-Qasas, you, you will be confused about a lot of things. See, the Quran deals with archetype, archetypes. Archetypes are, uh, for lack of better words, prototypes, blueprints. Uh, they, they represent uh patterns human patterns right and so pharaoh pharaoh is representative of the oppressive leader right and so uh the verse that he's mentioning in here is uh the english is Korah, in arabic is karun Karun. Does anyone know who Karun or Kora is? Karun with a Q, just in case you can't hear it from the microphone. Kora or English, I mean, Kora in English with the K, Karun in Arabic with the Qaf. Anybody know who that is? Who is Karu? And it's amazing how Umar ibn Said would just choose these seemingly or apparently random verses from the Quran and write them in the places that he wrote them. As it says, Umar ibn Said's inscription in the notebook of John P. Owen of Wilmington, North Carolina. Is anyone there? Can y'all hear me? Oh, yes, yeah, somebody can hear me. Bilal answered. A wealthy man during the time of Musa. Exactly. It says in the Arabic, Karum and Kaum and Musa. Karun was from the Qawm, the people of Moses, meaning 
they were family, specifically from the father's side. He was from Bani Israel. But if you read the Quran, you understand that Harun, he was down with Fir'aun. Fir'aun was oppressing Bani Israel. He was killing the boys and letting the women live. Why was he doing all of this? Because if you read the tafsir, the commentaries of the Quran, you know that the Pharaoh of the time had a dream. And in this dream, it was a boy or a man from Bani Israel destroying everything. And that dream was interpreted for him by the dream interpreters to mean that there's going to be a boy from Bani Israel who would overthrow the ruling dynasty. In other words, just to give you some more context, Bani Israel were in Egypt at the time. They're not from Egypt. Their origin, I mean, if you talk about Ibrahim, is from Iraq or, you know, Babylon. And then after that, from Hashem, uh, Jerusalem, Palestine, Syria, well, that, those areas, or Canaan, Canaan, right? They came to Egypt because of Prophet Yusuf, Surah number 12. If you know the story of Yusuf, the father of Yusuf, Yaqub, Jacob, who's also known as Israel, as well as his brothers, who Yusuf forgave for doing that stuff to them, uh, came and resettled in Egypt because of the famine. Bani Israel means the children of Israel, meaning the children of Jacob. And so those were the 12 tribes of Israel come from, the children of Jacob. So they are in Egypt. And from the time of Yusuf up until the time right before Mo Mo Musa was born, Bani Israel, the children of Israel, were living good in Egypt. They were all right. They were cool. But you know, they're not from there. And if you ever lived in a place and you're not from that place, it don't matter how much the people like you. It don't matter how much good you've done to the people. Especially if those people don't fear Allah, you always be an outsider. And all it takes is the right person to make them flip on you. Remember that. This is a deep lesson that you can get from the Quran. Yeah, the people love you. Yeah, they treat you good. Yeah, you've done a lot of good for them. Yusuf done a lot of good for Bani Israel. He say, I mean, from for Egypt. He saved them. Read Surah Yusuf. But just like that, someone was able to get the people of Egypt to flip on Bani Israel and make them an underclass. Make them someone that is targeted for oppression. If you look at Nazi Germany, if you look at right in the uh, late uh, 1990s when the situation in Bosnia kicked off and you listen to the people who lived it, they will tell you, and obviously Hitler and all that was before I was born, but, you know, the situation in Bosnia happened right during the time period when I had came home from prison. I'm a Muslim, so I'm conscious, right? And the Muslims that survived that thing, if y'all don't, don't know, this is Eastern Europe, and you have a large Muslim population living there. 
they, they go back to the Ottoman Empire, but they're living there, right? And a lot of them, this is from the, from their mouths. A lot of them, they were just like Muslim culturally. They weren't like a lot of them weren't practicing their deen. A lot of them was just getting drunk, just like everybody else, and you know having girlfriends and boyfriends, and just just doing what everybody else did, even though they claim to be Muslim. So they would go to school with these people. They would, you know, go to the club with these people, just like what normal people do in these type of societies. And then came Slobodan Milosevic. And he started preaching his rhetoric against the Bosnians. And it's amazing because eth ethnically speaking, they're really the same people, the Bosnians, the Serbians, and all those people. It just, some of them happen to be Muslim. But because of the uh, rhetoric, literally, I mean literally, it was like somebody flipped on a light switch. And I remember hearing lectures, going, going, I've been Muslim at least that long. I remember listening to lectures from Bosnians who, was, uh, uh, who survived that situation. They was doing massive genocide. I mean, just like, just killing people. Men, women, children, digging mass graves, having mass rape ceremonies, just everything, just going crazy. This is the 1990s. And you said, who you think was like just the military? No, 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 no. It wasn't only, only the military. The common civilians got down with it. Literally, you will have for example, a girl who was Muslim, and she would have a boyfriend who's not Muslim. Then over, and it was like love and love, soulmates or whatever, right? Then overnight, when this thing got kicked off, he would come in and and and, and rape his girlfriend, and you know just have his homeboys participate, and that same boyfriend killing that his girlfriend's mom, and just everything, just like that, that quick. A few weeks ago, y'all was in love. Now he's doing what the military does to you. That's deep if you think about it, because this is something that happened in modern times. You don't have to go way back to look up, look on, uh, read up about it. You can actually, you can actually talk to people who made it here as refugees that can tell you about it themselves. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Abdul Bar and Imari, Imad, right? And so think about it. This is people like, you know, they're cool, right? They, they don't mind that I'm Muslim. Uh, yeah, all right. All it takes is someone to push that right button. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Khadija. And so I'm saying all that to say that if you go back and examine with Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam, and what Bani Israel represented, for the people of Egypt, just to one day for the king, and the title of the king in that area at that time, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, right? Uh, they, he can have a dream. The dream is interpreted for him. Then all of a sudden, someone that was living good in that society, they get flipped on. And now, Every child that is born, every male child that is born is killed. And it started when they started, they would Pharaoh would have his soldiers, his military, stand by for every woman from Bani Israel who was pregnant. When they gave birth, it would be a soldier right, right there, ready to take the child away to kill him. Why? Because they're trying to prevent a, the rise of a messiah. You know, it's that terminology that Jehovah used. Jericho Hoover used, right? They were trying to prevent something. They were trying to pre be preemptive in preventing the coming of Moses. So they're killing the boys. And they also enslave them. They enslave Bani Israel. And all of this is in the Tafsir. Like, you know, we don't have to go jump to other sources. It's right there in the Tafsir. So Does the men 
are getting older. They're killing all of the boys. It's genocide. They're killing all of the boys. So their slave population is getting old. So they amended their constitution. They had their own version of the 13th Amendment, right? And so they said, okay, we can't keep doing this because we won't have anybody to do the work that we don't want to do, right? So let's start killing the boys every other year so that we can control the population but at the same time, we still on the hunt, on the lookout for this uh, Messiah that's going to come, this Moses that's going to, you know, overthrow us and take take it over. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and Farouk. Yeah, I was referring to Bosnia. So. They started doing this. And so if you read the commentary of Quran, you know, Moses was born during a year where they weren't uh, killing the boys. So, I mean, excuse me, not Moses, uh, Harun, uh, Moses' older brother. Moses, Musa, was born during a year where they were killing the boys. So that's why the Quran mentions, particularly in this surah, Surah Qasas, of how uh, what Musa's, the mother of Musa was fearing for her child's life because they were killing all the boys. By this time also, they didn't necessarily have to get, have soldiers to kill the newborn babies. By this time, they had raised up a crop of wet nurses from Bani Israel from the children of Israel themselves that would uh, kill the boys on behalf of Pharaoh. I'm mentioning all of this just to give you some backdrop on this verse that he, Umar ibn Sayyid wrote, verily Korah was from the people of Musa. Woe to every, uh, every scorner who gathers money, etc. right? So, Musa, you know, when he, and in the, in the Quran, the same surah, describes how Musa caught a body. Yes, Prophet Musa caught a body. And he killed a cop. He killed an Egyptian. And someone snitched on him. His own people. Go to the beginning of the surah. It's all there. You have to, you have to understand this surah to understand the time that we live in it. Once again, if you don't, you'll be confused about a lot of things that you see happening in your life in real time. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The thing. So Musa gets out of Egypt, and he ends up under the care and working for a man named Shu'a. In, a, in another land, safe from the reach of Pharaoh. And the scholars differ if this Shu'aib is Prophet Shu'aib or another one Shu'aib from the same land as Prophet Shu'aib, same place. So Prophet Musa marries one of the daughters of Shu'aib. This whole story is beautiful. There's uh, so many lessons in this. I think somebody should write a detailed book on the lessons that you can get from Prophet, the story of Prophet Musa. And I think if somebody was to do a detailed book, it will be several volumes. It won't even just be one volume. SubhanAllah. But in any case, you know he's with his family. And that's when he gets commissioned by Allah to go uh, warn Fir'aun. He becomes a prophet. And he's, and he's commanded to go uh, to get his people and to give da'wah to Fir'aun. And Musa asked Allah for certain things to help him do the job. 
And again, all of this, uh, you can write a book just on this part right here. Allah gave Musa a job. Musa, in turn, asked Allah for the tools necessary to do the job. Rabbi Shahri Sabdi, my Lord, expand my breast for me. And Yasir Li Amri. And make my task, my affair easy. And take the knot from my tongue. He had a speech impediment. Why did he have a speech impediment? He had a speech impediment because when he was young, right, Fir'aun had, he started seeing special traits in him. And he started thinking, I need to kill this dude. He was born during the wrong year anyway. He might be the one that we're looking for. And so uh, they put some rocks and some coal, some jewelry and some coal in front of him, right? And, you know, usually the child is going to reach out to whatever's shiny. But this was a test from Fir'aun. If he would have grabbed the, the shiny jewelry or whatever it was, then Pharaoh would have killed him. Angel Jibril pushed Musa's hand for him to grab the burning hot coal and he put it in his mouth and it burnt his tongue. And that's why he got had a speech impediment. So this is why years later, when Allah made him a prophet, he said, and take the knot from my tongue because he had a speech impediment. And he's, well, so that they can understand what I say. And then he said, watch Ali and make for me a uh, wazir, min ahli. Make, give me an, an, a wazir, a helper from my family. This is Surah uh, Taha, Surah number 20. And again, subhanAllah, like I said, this book from Prophet Musa in detail will be a whole lot of volumes. This is coming from Surah Taha. Surah Taha, which is chapter number 20, is the verse that Kabab ibn Arat was reading when he bust in on when he was teaching his sister. Surah Taha. And most of that surah is about Prophet Musa. And if you know anything about Umar ibn al-Khattab, he is Musa. <laughs> he is, I mean, he, he is the Musa of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's time. In fact, after the Battle of Badr, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Umar, he said, you are like Musa. He said he, he said he was like two prophets. He's like Nuh, he's like Noah, and he's like Moses. That's what uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was taking Shura. And Umar suggested that you kill all the prisoners of war, right? And he said, he told Umar, he said, you're like Prophet Nuh and you're like Prophet Musa. You know, the Sahaba, they inherit lights they inherit and war lights from prophets like we don't believe in reincarnation and that all that type of stuff but we do take certain things from people that come before us right and you if you study prophet musa very closely and you study umar ibn al-khattab closely there's no way that you can you can uh uh miss the similarity no way it's impossible even in that surah in other surahs uh Musa used to carry a stick. Umar is well known for carrying a stick. I mean, there's so many, it's just, it's amazing. But in any case, so when Musa asked Allah for a wazir, an assistant from his family, he said, Harun, Ahi, Harun, my brother. At the moment that he made that dua, Allah made Harun a, brother, a, a prophet. There's, you can make a whole little book on based upon what happened here. You can make a whole little book on how when somebody gives you a job, what you should do is to make sure the one who's giving you a job gives you the tool to do the, jo the tools to do the job properly. But this is what Musa is asking of Allah as a job. And this is happening directly with no intermediary. Allah has speech, right? 
Allah has divine speech. You know, we Ashari, right? So we, you know, Allah has the attribute of Kalam. To call him Allahu Musa Taklima. And Allah spoke to Moses directly, right? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Anthony. And so at the moment, literally the moment that Musa made this dua, Allah answered it and made Harun a prophet as well. Why all this important? Because there's a backstory to everything. Nothing just got the way it is because he just got to the way it is. This verse says, Karun is from the people of Musa. Karun got jealous because he had money, he had bread, he had affluence. Why Allah make Musa and Harun prophets didn't make me a prophet? He was jealous because he wasn't given Nabuwa, he wasn't given prophethood. And that jealousy made him act, act alongside and, and cooperate with their enemy against his own people. So, the, when we talking about Umar ibn Sa'id and the level of knowledge that he had, you have to assume that he knew all of this. Everything I just mentioned, he knew and in more detail. You know, like on a black man's round table, you're talking about what a scholar is. He would have been a scholar with the amount of time that he studied and what he studied. He'd have been a scholar. So I don't want you to think that, okay, it's just some doodlings of some old decrepit Muslim man Nah, this person had all of this information in his head. And for whatever reason, whatever he intended by it, he's writing these things. It's not just no accident. So I'm sorry, Samir. I had to, you know, it's no accident he wrote that. Uh, Bismillah. You can start. Uh, you can read again. I'll try not to interrupt you again. Bismillah. <clears throat> One, the first, the unique with no beginning and the last, the everlasting with no end. Verily, Korah was the people of Musa, and what, oh woe to every scorner who gathers money and continuously counts it. He reckons his money will give him eternal life. No, it hurls him into the crusher. And how do you come to know what the crusher is? It is the fire of God, well-fueled, which ascends into the heart. Verily, the hellfire is upon them in columns outstretched. So what was read after that, as the footnote indicates, is sort of uh, 104. Continue. Number seven is uh, referring to the markings. And then eight, this is my vicar. I beseech you. O oh God, for forgiveness and to acceptance, repentance, and to accept repentance. And for, O oh Lord, I seek to keep you in mind so this be manifest. Did you want me to read a footnote on 136? Yes. Footnote 136 says, Muhammad Ismail suggests that it should read Gafara wa Tauba. Omar had not written the far without an ah at the end of the word. I noticed that a ra is missing on the word dhikr using this reading. David Babayan emails me on 4-12-2020 that the word tajali is not found in the Arabic Bible owned by Omar Ibn Said. If written Following Arabic grammar norms, this line should read. Let me put on my glasses. 
هذا ذكري يا الله مغفرة وتوبة و ويا إلى خذوا من تجالي تجالي okay. Then on page 162 begins in rear inside page nine. Did we not expand for you your breasts and we removed from you your burden? Ten, O oh, you who believe, repent unto God with sincere repentance. And remember what the angel said to Mary, said of Mary. Truly, God has elevated thee and purified thee of the women of the world. And then no uh reference to the the markings there okay just to show uh what it looked like you don't have the book Okay, 164. Bismillah. A true story of an African prince in a southern home by Dr. John Frederick Ford. From the sacred and profane history, we learn that for unnumbered centuries, all the fallen nations had become barbarous and idolatrous idolatrous and in exterminating one another pillage and death were the fruits of conquest and the captives were slaughtered or reduced to slavery for domestic use or sold and deported to other countries not that god sanctioned these acts because of their virtues but as a means of extermination when america was discovered England, Spain, Portugal, and other modern nations were perpetuating African slavery by buying captive prisoners of war and non-combatants stolen for trade. About 75 years ago, a slave ship landed and sold a cargo in or near Charleston, South Carolina. Among the number was a son of a king of the Malays or Malays of Central Africa. Not willing to become a slave and knowing the English language, he ran away and lived in the forests and swamps until he was captured near Wilmington, North Carolina, and lodged in jail and advertised and sold to General John, James Owen at a large price. While in prison, he covered the walls with writing of a language unknown to scholars of the town, afterwards proved to be Arabic. General Owen was brother of one of the former governors by that name who bought him as a curiosity, who built for him a house on his lot near his mansion, supplied all his wants and gave him the liberty of the city. The only service he did during his natural life was to do shopping and carrying messages for the family when needed, giving him time for reading and study. Having been well educated in his native language, soon adapted himself to the language and customs of the best people around him. Became a devout Christian and a member of the first Presbyterian church with the Owen family while he lived being called Uncle Moreau and highly respected by all of both of the city and many visitors. In the fall of 1855, the writer was a lay member of the North Carolina Conference of the M.E. Methodist Episcopal Church South, which met in Wilmington and with others enjoyed the hospitality and kind attention of Miss Ellen Owen, daughter of Governor Owen, for nearly a week. When the name and history of the ex-prince were discussed, Miss Ellen proposed sending for Uncle Moreau. He was received in her splendidly furnished parlor and introduced to each visitor by receiving the right hand of each both, each between both of his and giving a hearty shake, after which was seated among the guests. 
He was a fine looking man, copper colored, though an African, well dressed in a long black coat reaching below the knee as worn by the nobility of the foreign countries of his day. Sat very erect on his chair with both feet flat on the carpet, knees close together and his hands opened and resting on his knees. He conversed for a short while gracefully after which Miss Ellen handed him the family Bible and asked him to read a lesson in his native language. He announced the 23rd Psalm and read it. When I asked if he would kindly write it for me, he did so and came with it for another interview. I was out visiting other friends and failed to see more of him. But the Psalm was written and left for me, which appears as written. During the conference, the late Charles F. Deems, DD, then of the North Carolina Conference and later pastor of the Church of the Strangers of New York City, preached for a preached to a crowded house. He began by saying he had met old Uncle Moreau on his way to church and told him the text from which he was going to preach from and how would he treat the subject. He gave him the divisions and outlines of a sermon from it. And the doctor said they agreed with his views and he would follow them, which showed the African to be a theologian also. Theologian also. Theologian. Theologian also. Later, Miss Ellen Owen became the wife of the late Honorable Hayward Wayne, and they lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I visited them and learned of the death of the domesticated African prince, but failed to learn more of his life and history, which I have always regretted. His name in his native language was Omero. The following is the 23rd Psalm as written by the ex-prince in his native language, accomplished by his likeness, kindly furnished by the Honorable A.M. Waddle and Mr. H.M. Ford of Wilmington, North Carolina, with additional testimony as given. The old man died in 1864 and was buried in the family graveyard on the plantation of General Owen in Bladen County, North Carolina, and was said to have been a Freemason in his native country. The 23rd Psalms given to Dr. John F. Ford. We are indebted to Reverend John Fox, D.D., Correspondent Secretary of the American Bible House, New York City, for the cut from the manuscript furnished him of this 23rd Psalm. The following letter will explain itself. New York, New York, April 12, 1904. Dr. J.P. Ford, Statesville, North Carolina. Dear Dr. Ford, I send you herewith a copy of the translation of the manuscript. It is a little startling to find that Uncle Moreau still retained a little weakness for Muhammad. The curious little square on the lower left hand corner is a seal, but the meaning of it is not quite clear. The translation was made by Professor R.D. Wilson of the Princeton Theological Seminary, a very accomplished Semitic scholar, and I'm sure you could not have gotten it more accurately done. You will see from this which is the top which is the top and which is the bottom as the little square like this on the left hand corner. Verily, very sincerely yours, John Fox. Translation. In the name of God the merciful and gracious, may God have mercy on Prophet Muhammad. So it's on. I am beginning to write this I'm beginning to write this writing, manuscript in the year 1855, in the month Nuba in the 11th day, Monday, then follows the 23rd Psalm, then follows, I have sent forth this writing manuscript through thy mercy, which is named over me. I uh, just wanted to uh, mention, and it's something that we shouldn't, uh, uh, let miss us. In the Quran, 
I forgot exactly where it is, but it's easy to find. Allah makes mention in talking to his beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I'm just using my uh, remembering, remembrance of the meaning. It is not you, O Muhammad, that they have a problem with, but is it is it is me and my message that that they have a problem with. In that verse, which I said I can't remember, it was revealed specifically. It has a specific reason why it was revealed, but it also has a general. Uh, <clears throat> A general application that it was revealed specifically about Abu Jahl, and if you look at Abu Jahl himself, he said, he said, you know, he believed that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is truthful, and he he spoke about why he's if he believes he's telling the truth and he's a good person, why am I fighting him? It was basically jealousy. Because all the things that he, uh, his family, his bloodline had did for the Arabs. And basically, you know, for example, uh, Abdul Muttalib, he rediscovered the well of Zamzam along with the gold that was, that was there with it. And uh, because of that whole, if you know the Sarah, there's a whole story to it. And because of that whole situation, the pr the pl price of blood money went from uh, uh, ten camels to a hundred camels. And then you know, and then uh, uh, Hashem, you know, who comes after him now? Hashem, his name is not Hashem. His name is Amr, right? But he was given the title Hashem because the the Prophet's family, so the Lord was responsible for feeding the pilgrims. It was part of the government, right? Hospitality. And he started crushing up bread to put in the soup to feed the pilgrims. And so that made people love him even more and made his uh, reputation grow. So just the name Hashem, right? And then, then his son, uh, uh, Abdullah, right? Supposed to be sacrificed, right? And... The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I, Ana ibn Zabbihain, I am the son of the two sacrificed ones, or the two that were supposed to be sacrificed. In other words, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the son of Abdullah, who was supposed to be sacrificed by his father, Abdul Muttalib. If you don't know what I'm referring to, just go back to the story of how Abdul Muttalib uh, rediscovered the well of Zamzam. And then, you know, Hashem is the father of Abdul Muttalib. And then going back, their lineage goes directly back to Ismail, the son, Prophet Ismail, alayhi salam, who's the son of Prophet Abraham, Ibrahim, alayhi salam. And Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son Ismail, right? We know that story. And so Abu Jahl mentioned all of these things and then said, how can we compete with all of that? And now he, com now, now he complained, now he claims to be a prophet. Nah. No, I ain't going for it, right? Benny uh, Ma'zum, uh, Ma'zum, Benny Ma'zum, which is the clan of Quraysh that Abu Jahl is from, uh, it was like competing. He's Quraysh too, but, you know, he's not from that specific family of Quraysh. And so I mentioned that verse, like I said, I can't remember the verse. Maybe one of you could look it up, right? But that verse taught me that people that show enmity to Islam, they have an intense hatred for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like non-believers, they claim we worship some other God, right? But you notice they don't spend as much time abusing and cursing Allah, a'udhu billah, as they do cursing and abusing Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's the brunt of their attacks. In the same way that during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's lifetime, he was the brunt of the attacks during his life. But Allah is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah, even though, even though you're getting the brunt of it, their real beef is with me. 
Why? Because he's the one who sent it, right? Obviously, you can't take it out on a law, so you won't take it out on the one he sent, the messenger. Now they say, don't kill a messenger. They always try to kill a messenger. And so it is still a little startling to find that Uncle Moro still retained a little weakness for Muhammad, right? And I don't know, from what I've read so far, taken into account, what it must have been like to live during his time as a black man during the period of slavery. And he's getting all of this special treatment that really nobody else around him is getting. Can't read, can't write. When I say can't, not allowed to read and write. Remember, we mentioned that they had laws on the books no later than 1822 prohibiting, making it a capital punishment, where he was at in both North and South Carolina for literacy. But he's given, he's being allowed to read and write. So the fact that he was a slave and they're, they're pushing him to become Christian. Me personally, I'm not convinced that he apostated. I mean, if you just look at what he wrote in his writings, you could say, if you just take away the whole context, oh man, any, any person wrote this is a kufr, he's kafir, right? Nah, this is why we did that whole thing about uh, taqiyya. I personally believe, ev even though he written what he wrote on many occasions, and if you take that out of context, yeah, that could be kufr. I'm just taking into context his situation, his circumstance, and he getting the benefit of the doubt for me. That's just me personally. And we didn't even reach the end of the book yet. But even in those places where he would apparently testify or prove his so-called belief in the Trinity, right? It'll always be, be the basmala there, be prayer upon the Prophet Wasallam there and everything. So you know, this is my uh, uh, this is my personal opinion, and these are the pictures of the book. I think this is the same. Anthony said, yeah, Reverend Fox knew he didn't apostate. That's why he hating in the letter. Yeah. That's my opinion. Okay, page 170 in show. The two lines of Arabic reads, Umar ibn Sa'id ibn Adam, followed by the five-pointed star, and then a reference to a blog uh, a blog page. One autograph of a slave of General Owen of Wilmington, North Carolina, was the son of an Arabian merchant sold into slavery. He later became a Christian while enslaved in the United States and was known locally as Old Uncle Monroe by many who came to know him. This is the part of the Simon Gratz collection at Historical Society of Pennsylvania, HSP. Arabian Simon Grant's collection alphabetical series. The note in English reads, this is the auto autograph of an old slave of General, General Owens of North Carolina, who was the son of an Arabian merchant. The name is in Arabic. He was taken, sold into slavery, became a Christian and blessed God for the grace in which he stood. I have seen him sitting as was his custom on the front seat in the Presbyterian Church in Wilmington, and all respected old Uncle Monroe, as he was called. Uh. 
Alhamdulillah. Continue. Undated manuscript of the Lord's Prayer, transliteration. Bismillah, Hirak Man Rahim, Sallallahu Sayyidina Muhammad. Um, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, prayer to Allah for our Master Muhammad. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, O Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Umar Ibn Said Ibn Adam and my mother is Uma Yara Maka. May Allah comfort her rest in place. Alhamdulillah. Let's stop there for today, inshallah. Are there any questions? Samira, did you want to mention anything? No. I just wait a few more seconds to see if anyone's typing. And if not, we will close out. Alhamdulillah, I pray this information was beneficial as we are nearing the end of this text. Alhamdulillah. We learn a little bit more about our Islamic history and these black lessons. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us all in beneficial knowledge. May he make us practitioners of that knowledge. And may Allah give us the insight and the foresight to see ourselves as a people and move forward like a people. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika na shadu wa na ilaha 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 wa staqfuluku wa tubu ilayk wa la asu inna l-insana la fi khusa illa ladhina amanu wa aminu sa'lihati wa tuba sa'u bin haqti wa tuba sa'u bin sabu. Assalamu alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته